All right, now back with me here on Next on the T is our resident director of instruction, Tom Patry. Tom's home base is at Esplanade Golf and Country Club in Naples, Florida, but this summer he's all over the place. We're going to need a GPS tracker on TP's car to help us keep track of where he's at. If he's not in your area this week, he just might be soon. But if you still want to get a golf lesson from him, download the V1 video app and send him a video of your golf swing through there or send him a question on his website, TomPatry.com. You can also subscribe to his newsletter while you're on his site. Tom is also a member of the Titleist Leadership Advisory Board. He was a two-time first-team All-American at Florida Southern, and he won the Division II National Championship in 1981, was inducted into their Sports Hall of Fame in 2004. Tom's got his own show now on Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Instagram Live with some really fantastic guests, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. And it's always a privilege to have him back with me on the show. Hey, TP, how are you, my friend? Tricky boy! <laughs> I always love when you start off the show like that. How are you, TP? Chrissy, man, I, I need a pillow. I'm tired, man. No doubt. Dude, you yeah, are pretty- all over the map. Where where yeah, in the world pretty- is Tom Patry? Uh, Tom Patry right now is at Hidden Creek in Egg Harbor Township, New Jersey. And for those who do... You don't know where that is. That's about uh, 15 miles from Atlantic City, the Atlantic City Boardwalk. Um, it's a core Crenshaw golf course, part of the Dormy Network. And as you know, Chris, I'm now a Dormy ambassador. Um, why they did that or why they let me in here, God only knows, but thank them for that. Um, so it's been my first week on property. Had the, Let's see, I've had five golf schools done this week here. And I've got one more tomorrow. And then I hop in the car the next morning and drive. Uh, about 12 hours to Indianapolis, Indiana for a week, and then uh, get in the car and drive 18 hours to Amargansett, New York, which if you don't know where that is, that's about uh, five miles short of Montauk Point, the tip of Long Island, and do five half-day short game schools there. And then I spend two days with one of my juniors out there, and then I drive about uh, six hours to Saratoga, New York, and after that, I don't know where the hell I'm going, but I'm sure I'm going somewhere. (laughs) <laughs> my goodness tp um but for our listeners that don't remember about the dormy network talk about your ambassadorship and uh what that's all about yeah it's really pretty cool chris to be honest with you i i was asked to be part of the network uh, recently they uh the dormy network is a collection of six destination clubs um hidden creek being one of them victoria national riggs ranch in san antonio valley hack in outside of roanoke virginia Arblinks in Nebraska and the Dormy Club in Pinehurst, North Carolina, um, all high-end destination clubs, all with uh, beautiful, beautiful cottages on property, great practice facilities. This uh, Hidden Creek happens to be a core Crenshaw golf course, as is uh, the Dormy Club in Pinehurst. Um, really good. Uh, Victoria National, as you know, in uh, outside of Evansville, Indiana, hosts the Corn Ferry Finals. Um, really high-end destinations, great network of clubs. And I, I, you know, I don't want to do this on the show so much, but you can join the network for a number that I can't believe you can join it for. It's it's probably the greatest deal in America. So what they've asked me to do as a uh, ambassador is just basically expose the network to my database and my players. Um, I've had, uh, like I said, several schools here this week, and they've been blown away by Hidden Creek. It's a really, really fine golf course. You know, Core Cruncher just doesn't build any bad stuff, and the place is really fantastic. It's in great condition. Uh, I just got off the golf course about an hour ago with one of my students um, who loved it, absolutely loved it. And it's funny, when I get them here, I don't have to really sell them on the concept. I, I, I don't try to, but every day so far this week before I have even had lunch, they asked me if they could get a, a membership packet and what it's all about. So it, it, that's a, just a tribute to how good the facility is. And rumor has it that the old man shot 71 out at the creek today, true? The old man... Um, Found the club face more times than he's found it recently, and uh, and and made, finally figured out Bill Core's greens a little bit, made a couple of putts, and uh, I uh, I did whistle around in seventy one. Yes. There you go. Good for you, TP. So let's also talk about your show Thursday nights eight o'clock Instagram Live. You've got Bob Ford I've got, I've as got, your guest I've coming up. Yes, a huge guest coming up in a couple of weeks. I've got. Chris Mascaro coming up, not this Thursday, but the following Thursday. Uh, and I want you to know you're following royalty. You're following Bob Ford this week. 
Um, uh, so that's, that's a that's, tough that's act. That's pretty special. And by the way, you're you're a no sandwich in between. You're a sandwich in between Bob Ford and Bob Jones, Doctor Bob Jones. So I mean, wow, that's 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 pretty good bookends, Miss Carol. I hope you're up to that, man. I mean, I don't. I don't, no, know, I, I don't know. I don't. I I don't <laughs> think I got the bat speed to fit to fit in between those two guys. <laughs> so I. Uh, I started about, uh, I thought actually started during the pandemic, Chris, because I was bored out of my mind. I wanted something else to do. I don't, I don't have enough on my plate right now. So I, uh, I started doing the show on Thursday. Yeah, exactly. What am I thinking? I started doing the show on Thursday nights at 8 o'clock. And uh, just as a whim, and it's kind of taken off. Uh, I've had some great folks on. I've had Jimmy Roberts from NBC. And I've had, uh, I've had Damon Hack from the Golf Channel. I've got Bob Ford coming up. I just got a commitment today. From Jay Wright, who's the head uh, basketball coach at Villanova, he's coming on in a couple of weeks. Um, so it's it's been really fun. People who love golf and people who are around golf and people like yourself. So it's been a lot of fun. We've got a lot of followers already, and uh, it's kind of growing. But it was it's kind of just been an accident. It's a uh, I should call it the pandemic show. It's really as a result of of the virus <laughs> and over and being bored. But it's been fun. It's been fun. For those who don't know the details about who Bob Ford is, remind them. Well, Bob Ford is not only a really dear friend of mine, but he's he is basically, in my in my estimation, I don't think anybody would disagree with me, the consummate PJ Club professional. He's the uh, professional emeritus at Oakmont, retired there a couple of years ago, and still is the head professional at Seminole in Juno Beach, Florida. But Bob, not only being a good teacher, uh, is an unbelievable player. He's qualified in his career for 13 major championships. He's a winner of the Bob Jones, the prestigious Bob Jones Award from the USGA, and he's the honorary starter at the U.S. Open. Um, he's got a long list. I can go on and on, but he's he's really the premier club professional. He's he's like the model PGA professional and just uh, one of the icons in the PGA of America. And I've been blessed to have him as a friend for almost 30 years. And uh, I just left him a couple weeks ago. I, I made a side trip uh, between Indianapolis and coming to Hidden Creek and uh, spent two days at Oakmont with him playing and. I, I guess I'm trying to think, Chris. I'm 61, so I think Bob's 66 now, and he still plays pretty nice golf. He I, he qualified and played in the, uh, I think the British Senior Open last year. Um, so he still plays pretty good golf. TP, let's switch gears a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in the world of golf right now, and um, your thoughts on Bryson DeChambeau. Do you marvel at what you're seeing from him and the and the and the club head speed that he's able to generate, or do you look at it and say that's a back injury waiting to happen? I am Hans, and you are Hans, and we are here to pump you up. <laughs> what is that? What is what in the hell? I turned on the TV this week because I heard so much about it, and I had to see it. Um, and I hadn't really seen other than what I've seen on social media, and I and I watched. The I, I was working all day, so I watched the highlights in the evening and the replay in the evening. He he looks like he looks like a cross between the Fuji blimp and and uh, yeah and and Bozo the clown. I mean, this guy looks like it doesn't even look like the same person. Uh, it's incredible. I mean, and of course, I don't you know listen, I don't know anything, but I somebody's gonna explain to me uh, medically how you put on forty five pounds of mass. In, in under a year, somebody's going to explain that to me. Um, and I'm not I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but it, it, I don't know how you do that and 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 not die. Um, so if you think it's to answer your question, to get to your question, I'm, I'm rambling here, but yeah, at the speed he's swinging it at, uh, with the force he's swinging it at, I don't I don't know how your back holds up very long. Um, We've watched Tiger go through some tremendous injuries and, and some real heartache with it, with his body. Uh, I don't think you change your body that radically in that short a period of time and swing the club with that kind of aggression that many days in a row, and and you're not walking the tightrope to injury. I, you know, I, I think, you know, I, so many guys want to probably jump on the bandwagon now, Chris, but I, I think that now it's getting to the point where they're swinging the club. And you, and you know how much these guys practice. These guys had a lot of golf balls in the course of seven days every week or six days every week. I don't know if the lower thoracic spine is built to take that, you know, and how long that lasts. So 
In order for to you, to, to, I think what you alluded to a moment ago, TP, I think more and more guys are starting to look at this. And, you know, I mean, every sport's a copycat sport, right? We talk about that in the NFL all the time. It's a copycat league. You, you find something that works and everybody wants to try to do it. And now you're going to start to, are we going to start to see guys start to, you know, if he wins, you know, two, three more tournaments, throws a major in. Is that what we're, we're going to be at with guys trying to put on 20, 30, 40 pounds? over the, you know, over the winter months and start to swing out of their minds, which they already do, many of them. But is, is are we in danger that that's what golf's going to become at the pro level? Well, I mean, I certainly, I, I have to agree with you, Chris. You know, the, the tour, the, especially the men's tour, and I was so fickle. You know, somebody somebody shows up doing something and everybody jumps on it. You know, a couple of years ago it was Sean Foley. Now it's George Gankus. And now it's Bryson DeChambeau. It's kind of like flavor of the week. So everybody kind of jumps on board and then they jump off board. I mean, Sean, who was hotter than Sean Foley two years ago? And who's hotter than George Gankis right now? And now we have Bryson DeChambeau doing what he's doing. So these guys are always looking for the edge, always looking for something to make them better. The question about this is, though, this is not, this is not a swing technique. This is a complete lifestyle body change. And when you start messing around with your body, we watched David Duvall do this. We've watched a number of guys through the years go through things like their body, lose weight, gain weight, do this, do that. And we've had a couple of real disasters to some careers that have, that have really been derailed. Um, I think you got to be very careful with this stuff. I mean, I think what you're going to see more than anything, Chris, is that you're going to see PGA Tour careers, I think, get shorter. Because I think, you know, a number of guys will go down this road and their body will not hold up and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll blow out a disc or rupture a disc or a shoulder or something and, and they'll never be the same again. So I, I think, I guess my advice to anybody thinking about this is proceed with caution, just proceed with caution. So from the opposite perspective, Tom, course designers, superintendents to, to try to come back. Cause now we hear a lot about, we hear the phrase bomb and gouge, right? Hit it as far as you can. Hope it's in the fairway or, or maybe just in, in the first cut so you can sort of gouge it out of the rough and onto the green. So, you know, maybe you're, you're driving it you know, well over 300 yards. You're leaving yourself with a short iron to the green. No problem. Bang on the green. Are we going to have to have designers and superintendents start to put things out there at the, you know, 310, 320, 350 mark where there's a hazard? You know, we, we're growing in, the, we're, we're narrowing the fairways, growing up the rough. Because I, I, like we talked about this last week, uh, on the show and, you know, I'm sure you and I have talked about this too. You know, the toothpaste is out of the tube with respect to dialing back the golf ball and the equipment. So is it now on the designers and the superintendents to combat the distance issue? Well, I, I think a couple of things, Chris. I think, you know, let's not, let's not get too ahead of ourselves. A couple of years ago, not so long ago, they played a U.S. Open at Marion, which is traditionally by far and away the shortest course on the U.S. Open Rota. And leading up to that open at Marion, all, all everything that was written was about everything that was written and talked about on TV was how they're going to destroy Marion. It's too short. It shouldn't be a part of the open road anymore. Uh, it's you know it's it's past its time. And we remember what Justin Rose shot there to win. I think he shot even or one over. Um, so that was all course set up, and that place held up really really well because it's that good and that difficult on and around the putting surfaces and. Obviously, the golf course was set up in a way that there was a lot of penal rough. So I think in day-to-day PGA Tour golf, listen, birdies are sexy. Birdies sell, distance sells, um, bombing it sells, you know, making eagles sells. But if you want to change that and you want par to be a better par to score, which I don't think will ever happen in day-to-day golf, I think birdies sell. But in majors, certainly, I think, you know, that the landing areas have to change. I think the, the depth of the rough has to change. Uh, I think green speeds and pin locations have to change. I still think you have to put the golf ball very, very well. You can't spin the ball out of deep rough. You can't get the ball out of deep rough. And the width of fairways have to change because not only are they hitting it far, Chris, but they're hitting it straight. They're hitting it pretty much, you know, it's amazing how far he hit that ball during the last week at Rocket Mortgage. And, and really, relatively speaking, how straight, he hit a couple offline, but he had he had a lot of bombs that were right in the middle of the fairway, too. Um, so I think you have to make the landing areas more penal, not necessarily with bunkers necessarily at 350, 
But I think the rough length, if you want to defend the golf course, has to change. I think people like Jack at Memorial will not will not take kindly to DeChambeau taking apart in your field village, you know, limb from limb because he drives it up there and he has wedge into every green. So I think not necessarily this year he hasn't enough time, but in the future you'll see places like Muirfield Village and Invitationals, maybe, maybe Riviera, places like that, get a lot more penal off the tee. Tom, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk a little instruction. Um, I've heard you talk about before that, <laughs> that being a good teacher, you've got to be a good listener first so that you can understand what each one of your players wants. Not what you want, but what they want to get out of their golf game. Talk about having that conversation, and then how do you adjust based on what they tell you? I think that's, you know, Chris, I think that's, I'm so glad you asked that question. I'm being all seriousness. I think that as I watch and observe some younger teachers today start a golf lesson, they just start, you know, watching somebody hit golf balls and tell them what they want to do or what they want them to do and never asking them, what they're there for, what they, what, they, what their goals are. I think one of the things I find out when I ask people a series of questions at the beginning of a lesson, I ask a lot of questions before I get started, is a lot of people come to me not knowing what they want. So I said, listen, we we got to determine what you really want here first. It's not about what I want, it's what you want. I mean, what what is your misdo? What is your misgo? What's your contact quality like? You know, what's the strength of your game? What's the weakness of your game? And, and again, I'm asking questions that are their perception. So I don't take it, I don't take it for face value. I take it with a grain of salt, and then I watch them hit some shots. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. I played golf with Jay Wright yesterday, the coach at Villanova, and that was a good friend of mine. And uh, we played the first four holes at Hidden Creek, and he hit um, he hit four kind of shots that went really kind of hard left, you know, shaped hard left. And I said to him, Coach, is that your is that your normal miss? And he said, no, not really, because I don't know where that's coming from. So I looked over at one of our playing partners, who's his brother-in-law, and he kind of winked at me, and he goes, he shakes his head, like, yeah, nodding yes. So I, I continued to watch for a while, and he hit, during the course of the rest of the round, he hit every shot he missed, he hit hard left. And we got done afterwards and sat down and had dinner. And I said, Coach, I asked you on the fourth tee if that was your miss, and you said no, but that's – that's every every shot you missed today was exactly the same. There was no there was no deviation from the pattern. Do you understand that that is your miss? And he goes, "Well, I, I guess maybe it is then." And here's a guy that's a, a really astute, high level coach in another sport, and you know we he, we don't see ourselves very clearly sometimes. We prejudice our own view. So that's why you need a pair of trained eyes on you to really kind of decipher what's going on. So I'll sit down and I'll say to Chris Mascara, I'll say, Chris, what do you want to accomplish? What would you like to have happen to your game? If you could, you know, if you could create your own wish list, what would the ball do? What would you like to see the ball do? Because I can make any of those things happen for you as a coach over time, as long as you're willing to put the work in. What do you want to see happen? Do you want to see better contact? Do you want to see a particular shape, a certain trajectory? You know, do you want to chip and putt better? You know, what's your strength? What's your weakness? So I make sure that they really commit to what they want before we get started. So let's talk about a couple of the hard shots in golf. When we have a severe downhill lie, maybe the ball didn't roll all the way into the bunker. It sort of just trickled over the edge. Now we sort of got that downhill lie and we got to get it over the bunker and onto the green. How do we execute that shot? Why, why, why would you do something like that to me, Chris? Why would you do that? Do you not like me? <laughs> Dude, you, you're, you're the guru. Anybody, Come on, help me out. Why, why would anybody want that picture in their head at at at, at eight thirty at night? Seriously. Okay, <laughs> here we go. So you're, you're, you got a, you got a downhill lie. You got a bunker in front of you. So the first thing I say to people about that is, listen, you put yourself in a very precarious place. Okay, you you've 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 made an error. You're now in a very difficult position. And you're short sided yourself behind a bunker and you got a downhill eye over a bunker to a green. You know, maybe the pin and you know, maybe proxi close proximity to the pin is not attainable. So the first thing you've got to make a judgment on is, is, is without putting a lot of pressure on yourself, is 15 feet a good shot? Is 10 feet a good shot? Is 25 feet a good shot from that condition? 
I think people get in those situations, first of all, Chris, and, and I'm talking about management now, they try to hit the miracle shot, you know, and, and I think in every round of golf, there's three or four junctures in the round that if you take your medicine 20 feet past the hole, two putt, make five and get out of there, instead of trying to do something really cute and dumping it and then dumping it again and three putting and making seven or eight, I think that those four critical junctures in your round can change your whole day and really obviously radically affect your score. So I think first thing you got to do is make a real, real sound judgment about, hey, listen, based on my skill level, you know, what's really attainable here? What's safely attainable? Is 15 feet pretty good and two putt and get out of here? And, and let's, let's not, you know, let's not burn the ship down on one hole. That's number one. Number two is when you hit that shot, obviously the lie is going to be a big factor. You know, if the lie is decent, and we've now got this thing called a 60-degree wedge in our bag, and we can get the club on the ball halfway decently. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a little downhill or not. We play it a little bit further back in our stance. We get a little weight on our left leg, and we make a very, very crisp stroke and pitch the wall, like I said, 10 or 15 feet by, no harm, no foul. Now, if the lie is, the lie is compromised and the ball is really sitting down, now we gotta, you know, we got to make sure we accelerate through the shot. we got to play the ball further back in our stance because it is a downhill lie. Anytime we have a downhill eye, we put the ball closer to the uphill foot, which in this case would be your right foot or your trail foot if you're a right-handed player, okay? And and we don't get really cute. We hit a, we hit a very conventional shot, like I said, 10 or 15 feet past the hole and get out of there. So I think I think lie dictates a lot of those things. So let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about the uphill lie when it, when the ball is above our feet. So it's not straight up the hill. We got the ball above our feet tendency, at least for me, is to pull hook that shot. How do we hit that shot more successfully and give ourselves a chance? Hello, we, how far away are we, Chris? Let's say we're about 150 yards out. Okay, so you, you're absolutely right on here. In fact, if you, if you don't do anything to manipulate the shot, the ball should go left. So I say to people, listen, the ball's supposed to go left, so don't try to prevent it from going left. Let, you know, let's first of all check out a starting line that's a little right of the target, depending on how severely above your feet it is, and just make our golf swing and, and let the ball go left. But things, when the ball's above your feet, okay, first thing we're going to do is we're going to choke down on the club a little bit more, and we're probably going to take something with a little bit more aloft. Because if we, if we turn the club over like we will on a side hill above our feet lie, we're going to shut the face down a little bit. One of the reasons it goes left is because your golf swing gets a little flatter, a little more circular, and you create a little bit more club face rotation. And you, and you deal off the club. So I go up and loft a little bit. I aim a little right. And basically what I'm doing is I'm hitting a real, I'm hitting a pull. I'm hitting an intentional pull. And boy, we know those pulls, they go really far and they feel good, but they go left. So depending on how far above your feet it is, you have to make a judgment as a player about how far right you want to aim and, and allow it to go left. Tom, before I let you go. Remind our listeners again about your show coming up Thursday night and how they can stay up to date with all the great things you're doing on your, on your website and over social media as well. Yeah, Crystal, well, Thursday night's Instagram Live, TP Golf Instagram Live, is 8 o'clock every week on Thursday night. And like I said, we've got Bob Ford this week. We have the effervescent and, and intelligent Chris Mascaro the following week, and then Dr. Bob Jones after that. And we actually have, I'm sorry, before Bob, I'm wrong. Before Bob Jones, we have Len Matisse. We have Len Matisse from the Champions Tour, um, who's a former LA Open winner first, and then Bob Jones. Um, so you're really sandwiching some superstars there, Chris. I hope you have your A game that night. Um, I do. So I'm telling you, I don't have the bat speed to be in that lineup. No, I understand. You're, you're, you're going to be a, you're, as a Red Sox fan. You'll have no problem whatsoever. You'll, you'll step up <laughs> to the plate and hit a home. You'll be fine. No doubt. And then, uh, of course, social media, TomPatry.com is the website. Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, two pages. Um, and if anybody can find a bed for me on the highway somewhere between here and Indianapolis, <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, so, but I'm all over the place. And most of that information is on my newsletter, which you can subscribe to uh, via my website. And, and I can't think of anything else to say. I'm so exhausted. I'm going to go to bed now. Is that okay? Can I go to bed now, Chris? Nah, absolutely, TP. Go put your head down on a pillow, my friend. I can't thank you enough for being here. You're the best. Look forward to catching up with you in a couple of weeks. Tell Mr. Sutton I said hi. Have a great trip. Have a great show, rest of the show. And also tell Charlie Meacham I said hi. He's a dear friend. I will absolutely do that. 
Take care, TP. Go get some sleep. We'll catch up soon. Thanks, Chris. Good night now, bud. That's a great Tom Patry, P-A-T-R-I, TomPatry.com and at Tom Patry on social media. Hey, I'm telling you, folks, Tom's show is absolutely wonderful to to watch on uh, on Instagram Live. He does a great job. A lot of great guests that uh, that uh, we, we share together and, and uh, a lot of people that I get to learn about. So check him out online and, and make sure to give him a follow as well.